So life is a journey. You start at the beginning, you end at the end, wherever that is on either side of the, the spectrum. Um, and I am actually very honored um, personally to have this guest on because uh, he doesn't know that I've been watching him uh, for many years. And um, well, he knows after this introduction, of course, but he doesn't know that I've been watching him for many years and he's actually contributed to my growth as a, as a business professional. Um, but uh, we're here to hear his story and also to maybe even uh, talk about uh, our blended stories um, that he doesn't know about. Um, he is Alan Cosgrove and uh, I will introduce him in just a minute. Um, but before we do that, just a reminder that uh, there is a new business resources page on the commonsensepodcast.com website. It's the common sense, that's C-E-N-T-S uh, podcast.com forward slash resources. And on that resources page, you will have access to business resources if you're starting your business or if you're trying to scale your business. So uh, there is a business stress test that I just actually created. That's, that's on there now. Uh, Micah's library is also on there as well. So you can take a look and see what books that I've read that have contributed to the success of my business and might contribute to the success of yours. And there's also resources like Banner Buzz, like SiteGround. You'll be able to uh, really take that take your business to the next level with some of those resources. So check it out. It's the common sense podcast.com forward slash resources. And don't forget if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, hit that subscribe button and the like button. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform, make sure you subscribe wherever you get it. But before we get started with this interview, I'm Michael Logan. This is the common sense show. You're listening to The Common Sense Show. If you've just started a new business, or if you're just thinking about it, this podcast is for you. Michael Logan has a stellar track record coaching small businesses to achieve six-figure revenue streams. The advice on this show is what has allowed him to have over 15 years of experience as an entrepreneur. Here is your host, Michael Logan. All right, as I mentioned in the open, I have Alan Cosgrove here. And this guy is one of my favorites. He actually has a long rambling list that consumes 20 pages of accolades that he has accomplished in his career. Um, but the accolade that means the most to me is the fact that he has been a silent mentor of mine, um, like uh, almost like the force in Star Wars, because I've watched him for many, many years of my uh, journey as a professional in the fitness industry, um, moving me into the business part of owning, owning a business. He's Alan Cosgrove. He has written or contributed to 16 books. Um, he's the co-owner, co-founder of Results Fitness and Results Fitness University. We will get into that. He is an international speaker. Um, he opened his gym facility in 2000, and uh, it's been the same owners for over 20 years, which is amazing given a couple of things in the fitness industry that the attrition rate on average is uh, 50% over six months. <laughs> and number two, Jim simply don't last that long. Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, very, what, a, what a nice introduction. Cheers. Yeah. So um, I had you come on the podcast because I think that, so you have been in the fitness industry, but I feel like I feel like your business strategies transcend just the fitness, the fitness industry that itself. I think the way you look at business, the way you've run your business, the decisions you've made in your business, um, have are, are, are smart, simple decisions that have contributed to your success over the years. Um, but before we get into some of the nuts and bolts and, uh, some of the philosophical questions, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Um, and, um, and you know, your wife, Rachel, and, um, how you all uh, built results and what is results and all the other stuff? I think it's, uh, I mean, it could be a really long rambling story, but uh, I started in a, a town in Scotland. My uh, parents were unemployed. Um, we didn't have a, a lot of money growing up. And I, I, I tell this story just to explain my, my background. Like, like uh, I always tell people like, I've heard of Compton. I've heard of rough areas in the US. You guys probably haven't heard of Livingston, right? In Scotland and Bathgate, where it's just, you know, tougher, tougher towns uh, in, in Europe. Um, the, I was a, a competitive martial artist. I learned martial arts really for self-defense and as a competitive martial artist and sort of series of things. That led me to a path to be obsessed with um, performance and exercise science. 
which sent me down a rabbit hole of, of looking at that and ended up taking me to a, a junior college and getting a job for a year back to a junior college to see if I could get enough qualifications to get accepted to, uh, uh, I want to say a real college, a, a, a degree college. And yeah. that, that was really my, the path that I took. Um, when I was in college, I did a, a paper on uh, health and, and fitness um, unrelated to my, my degrees in sports science, but this was a, like an epidemiology of fitness paper but you had to create a fat loss and program, which I then gave to, to, to my mom who was overweight and had you know, some severe health issues. And the fat loss program that I got an A on didn't work at all. And my mom passed away from a heart attack due to obesity, um, mm. not maybe like six months to a year later. And then I just became interested in general fitness. And I feel like, you know, look at the 100 meter world record or the squat record or the you know the marathon world record and sports never been better the athletes have never been been better but we got an obesity crisis we got a you know a health epidemic so i just became fascinated about helping regular people and uh, through that journey uh, i ended up you know working over here i worked at a summer camp teaching taekwondo um i got a job at a local hotel where i was the strength coach for a, a heavyweight boxer and then I got a job at a gym in New York City, U.S. Athletic Training Center. And just through a series of uh, what I call the ripple effects, you drop a pebble in a, in a pond, there's ripples. Um, I met my wife, Rachel, in New York City. Mm. And we ended up moving out to, to California after a brief spell of moving back to Scotland. And I was just going to get a job at a gym here. And I just became, this is a lesson for people, I became massively frustrated with certain practices and colleagues and co-workers i suppose and if you complain it's my personal philosophy you complain about something three times the universe has sent you a message that you're supposed to solve it and <laughs> to solve it ourselves, i decided that i wrote down all my frustrations and i could solve them all by opening my own training facility and solving them all led to a whole bunch of other frustrations that we can get to another time <laughs> but <laughs> Uh, we opened results fitness with the idea being it would be a small um you know thousand square foot gym where i would train a few athletes and very quickly uh, rachel was going to support me by working at other gyms very quickly she was full-time in the facility too and here we are a few years later just honestly i i I think you're right with the, the principles of business are the same. Like the, people focus on the thing. Like I'm selling coffee, I'm selling widgets. I'm doing, I'm not teaching fitness, I'm teaching karate, right? The, the thing is irrelevant when the principles of, of business remain true. So I think I would, I would describe myself as, you know, a kid from a poor town in Scotland who did a couple of things right. That's funny. Um, have you ever, do you read or ever read Thomas Sowell? No. So Thomas Sowell is a economist uh, by trade. He's 90 now. He's a right, not done. Excuse me. He is <laughs> no problem. He is uh, a black intellectual. I, I uh, wish his name was more widely associated with uh, intelligentsia, but um, it, it's getting there slowly. Um, one of my favorite books is Discrimination and Disparities that he wrote. He wrote, he's written a whole bunch of books. And I just recently acquired one via a gift from a friend, which is entitled Barbarians Inside the Gates, which is pretty cool. Um, but you know, the funny thing is that not to get too far off course, but this is what I do, get too far off he's, course. All the, he's all published the time. a lot of stuff. I just pulled them up, sorry. <laughs> Most of his books he's written since he's, was, he turned 80 years old. That's crazy. Um, but, in, but in Discrimination and Disparity, he talks about um, a lot of the language that we get for poor like Southerners or associated with um, uh, poor blacks in America actually come from like poor areas of the UK and in Europe, Europe, where you're talking about, right? Like these terms are just um, terms that have been taken from other parts of the world where the same problems exist, but of course we're Americans. So we don't think that any, these same problems exist yeah. somewhere else, um, but they do. Um, so I just, I just thought that was funny when you when kind of was telling your story. I'm like, this is exactly what he talks about in this book, you know? It's, I, I've always said that, um, I haven't always said, I've been aware of this having moved from Scotland to here, that there's a, there's a joke over here, uh, an American, a Polish guy and a Jewish guy 
do a thing, right? Mm. And the the idea is the American is the star, the Jewish guy is tight fisted, and the Polish guy is is kind of dumb, right? That's mm. the same joke in the UK for an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman. It's the same <laughs> characters, right? The, the joke is entirely interchange, interchangeable, right? No, but it's just starring starring different people, really, right? And the joke is the Scots people are are tight fisted, the Irish people are the, the, the dumb guys, and of course the Englishman wins. Right, <laughs> he, right. He, he's the star, right? No, yeah, that's hilarious. No, it's it is it is funny. You know, I think that when people um, exist in echo chambers of thought in general, they don't tend to know things like that. Like even the term redneck came from South England. It, it's not from the U S right. And so we use it in America to describe someone from the deep South who we believe is, you know, less intelligent and uh, drives pickup trucks and shoots off rifles. But really it was describing a certain person in South England, which, uh, which I just find that fascinating. Uh, something that he goes into, like I said, in the books, but Thomas soul is someone that you should definitely put on the, on the list. And, yeah. and here's the reason why, because I would never have found out about like you and your lectures, the stuff that you were doing, Thomas Plummer, um, some of the, um, the people who have been speaking at the more prominent fitness events, and I'm talking about fitness events. Um, if you're listening to this, um, conferences where we're, uh, fitness professionals gather to listen to people like Alan, if I didn't, without uh, kind of bumping up against a saying that Thomas Sowell wrote in his book. And I always say this in almost every podcast. Um, it, one of the things that I appreciate, he says, is um, it takes an extraordinary amount of knowledge to understand the extent of your own ignorance. And I did not realize what that meant until after I, I don't know what success is, but after I became more successful than I previously was, right? Like, um, I'm thinking like, I, I, I now kind of understand the journey, which is like, you have to get to a point where you get enough knowledge to understand that you don't, you don't even, you're not even close to the target. Um, yeah. How did you develop, put the target in your sights when you started results fitness? Like, you know, given that that's the case, what did you do to, to, to gain and gather that knowledge so that you could become, correct me if I'm wrong, your facility was also rated one of the top facilities in America, right? Yeah, a couple of times. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know the, the obviously keep that how to score it. <laughs> <It's a secret. laughs> Otherwise, you could not clear it. But is it? Just to touch on something funny before I answer that question is that if we talk about the history of language and rednecks, um, the phrase "jocks" was a derogatory term to describe Scottish people from from England. Was it really? Were, they were all like it's a nickname for Scottish people, the jocks, right. which has become over here that the guy that's no like no intelligence right just just a just a physically strong tough person uh so wow. it, it, it is there, there's a trace there's a everything can be traced right like right like it didn't start here and as far as that the center of the target goes i just i believe everyone has a question that drives them mm -hmm. right and my question was always like why are we why are we not better at this and we know more about, for example, fat loss than anybody's ever known, ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still bad. Like, we're mm -hmm. still not helping, right? And I just always had this idea, like, there's got to be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. There's got to be, right, how can we refine this? How can we make it better? I mean, like, I'm looking at little, like, constantly little things to, to improve. And I think just that, that sort of drive, and, and mm -hmm. I hate, like, I think the word mindset is constantly overused, but this is your internal operating system, mm. right? That you, that it'll run down. I just, before we got on this, I was downloading the new iOS system from my computer and I had to pause it because it was taking so long. But now the computer will run differently, right. ideally more efficiently. So right. every, every, uh, like there's, there's a part where I feel like, like sometimes like I'm sitting in my library, there's a bunch of books behind me and um, reading reading books is like you're downloading the software right like you don't you don't sometimes you don't understand what's going on but you're downloading the software until it's there right but there is that i think there's a little graph between like a true expert and how competent they feel when they give an answer mm -hmm. and someone who knows nothing and how competent they feel when they give an answer like like man when i was started off coaching people you know in the, in the early to mid i started teaching taekwondo in the 80s but 
mid to early 90s coaching people, man. That kid knew everything. That kid was so smart. Now mm-hmm. that same version of that kid, now, like you know, 20, nearly 30 years later, right? this guy knows nothing. Uh, <laughs> right? It's true, but yeah. 25 years of reading and seminars and, and education experience, and I'm less confident with my answers than I was at 22. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's so true. You know, it's we live in, well, obviously the, the self-described information age, right? And yeah. information is power information is capital. The reality right now is that if, if you are an expert or someone who has expertise in the domain and you're not selling it right now, um, you're probably missing the boat because it will, it will move on to something else, another focus. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. So I was listening to a heart surgeon, give a dissertation on fasting. I am a huge, huge fan of intermittent fasting. And he was talking about the science behind fasting. And to your point, what a lot of the health benefits of fasting are actually known and they're known by quite a, they're quite ubiquitously known in the medical community, but nobody promotes, nobody promotes them. Nobody promotes it because it's not, it doesn't sell, you know, they're in the business of making people better only after um, they become diseased than be, than preventing them from become diseased. And, you know, he was talking about, and I didn't know this, this statistic, but there's literally documented research that has been done with years or something. I can't, I'm not sure if it's five decades of research or not, but fasting for X amount of time. And I know you're a cancer survivor multiple mm-hmm. times can reduce your risk of cancer by 70%, a se- one seven day water fast that sends your body into autophagy and allows your cells to uh, essentially um, clean out the mitochondria, regenerate new m- mitochondria. And um, that process that uh, autophagy um, contributes to can reduce your risk of, of um, because when it kills off the, when your body kills off the dead cells and, re- and regenerates new cells, some of the cells that die off are cancerous cells. I thought it was the most amazing thing that has never been talked about, but that people should know. But There's actually a theory on that where I'm, I mean, I'm not going to present this as medical advice and I'm probably misinterpreting it that that because uh, <laughs> I'm an idiot. Right. But there, there's a theory that part of the, the, the mechanism by which chemotherapy works is to destroy appetite, which creates this um, inadvertent fasting because mm. you don't want to eat, right? And right. I can, I, I can uh, attest to that part that there, there may be, and you, it would be hard to isolate that, right? To, to mm-hmm. actually prove this hypothesis, it would be entirely unethical. You know, like right. there is a part where like, we have a proven treatment where, where this has worked to save lives. Let's mess with it, right? <laughs> and right. see if it makes it better or worse. But there is a, a and particularly with, um, that there is some strong evidence with, um, with brain cancer, which is one of the, 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 the toughest ones. I, I hate to see, worst cancers they're no good ones right i right. hate when someone not goes well, that's one of the better cancers to get i'm like well that's the one you're looking to get then like, <laughs> right, exactly. like, and there's no good cancers <laughs> there is a, a theory though with uh, and some evidence that the ketogenic diet works with brain cancer and part of the mechanism again is because mm-hmm. the appetite seems to go down with that that's right, right? and i did an article for um men's health and uh, i i won't mention the gentleman's name but he is a a brain uh cancer specialist Mm-hmm. And I said, right off the record, it's your daughter. What do you do? And he goes, one of the things would be a, a ketogenic diet. He goes, with, he goes, there's some strong evidence with vegetable intake. But I was like, off, off the record, like, what, what's something? And, and he, he was the one that suggested part of it is mm-hmm. this, this, um, like this, this uh, fasting uh, con- concept, right? Again, I'm messing yeah. this up for the listeners, so don't be... But you're going diagnosed. You, don't be going out doing this just because you have on a podcast. This is not sport. medical advice, but yeah. I did. I did hear um, that. Yeah. So, so, so during a fast, I think it's something around the seventy-two hour mark, when, you, when your body has a whole bunch of ketones available to it because of a fast. The thing is, is that there's only two kinds of energy that actually can cross the blood-brain barrier and actually provide energy to your brain. So, one of them is carbs and, and yeah. like glycogenesis. Um, and the other one is something else. I can't remember exactly. However, what happens is, oh, oh, ketones, excuse me. Ketones can do it as well. When your body fast after, I think the first 72 hours, 
um, and your 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 body uh, through the process of breaking down triglycerides for energy in your body. Part of the things that it breaks down is a substance, um, uh, some of the ketones or whatever that can actually cross that blood brain barrier. So one of the and and actually um, according to what I I've I've heard, um, your brain perf- prefers that fuel over. Um, over the glyco- the fuel from glycogenesis. And um, so what the, one of the doctors I was reading was saying was, if you're going in for chemotherapy, and now this is not a standard treatment because they give different advice. This is, again, this is not yeah. medical advice, but which was that he would have, he said that he would have his, to your point, he would have his um, uh, patients um, that were going into chemo fast mm-hmm. instead of eat before. And, and instead of to use the medicine to control nausea, he would have them fast because their body would actually handle the um, chemo better fasted than they would. That's interesting. They would full. I, I can tell you anecdotally, you, you don't feel like eating too much. <laughs> <Doing that. laughs> so, that, that, I mean, like I said, the, the stuff I'd read is that there may be, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm a pro science guy. Let's just establish that. And this is a, sure. a proven medical treatment, but there, there could be this adjunct to it that um could be the mechanism could be investigated further for sure yeah that's right Uh, offline i'll send you the video i watched i think you might enjoy it so going back to your results um what so what is it what is the it factor is it you and your wife rachel that make results special therefore having lasted for two decades or is it what you and rachel have created as the it factor it's probably just me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, um, I think it, it um, I posted this on Insta not, not so long ago. It, if you keep fish, if you have an aquarium or you keep goldfish, the, the health of the fish is dependent upon the cleanliness of the water, the mm. environment, right? The success is about the environment. So I always have this like, if a fish gets sick, what do you do? Mm. And I, a whole bunch of trainers at a conference will be like, flush them down the toilet. I'm like, that's a late stage thing. It's not the first thing you do. You clean the water, you change the right. environment. Right. And I think sometimes like I could hand you my programs. Like people could pick up my program design book or, or one of the mainstream books I've written and you've got the programs and you can open a gym with, with better equipment than me. Mm-hmm. You don't have that environment. You don't have that culture that we've created. Then I, I, don't, I don't think you would beat me. Not, mm-hmm. not that I, I think in terms of winning or losing like that. But that, uh, that culture is king. And I mm-hmm. think we create an environment where people are supportive and we continually are looking at not just the physical environment, like is, the, is your place clean? Do you have access to good equipment, good coaches? Do you have space right, right now, post-pandemic? Do you have good air filtration, et cetera, hygiene practices? We, um, we've created a culture of, uh, of winning mm-hmm. and, and winning is... Uh, different to everybody we could a cultural support and uh, right. we have if you had a pr in my gym whether it's for weight lifted reps done anything you ring the success bell you ring the victory bell mm-hmm. and the whole place will clap and cheer you hear the bell it's like pavlov's dogs you hear the bell our place is yeah <laughs> right, right. And that, so i think that the if i was to say the magic it was to do, defining like a sort of i guess a, a core value uh culture right with the mm-hmm. uh, with our in, the, the internal operating system is for the whole facility. That that's the and this is something we teach at um one of our, our mentorships is developing your core values. And the young coaches and gym owners come in, they're like, ah, I want to get to how to write programs and billing and contract law and things like that. And I'm like, just when you establish that this is what you want. Mm-hmm. And and for example, that if you know me for any length of time, I joke around a lot, right? All right I, yeah. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna take I take my job seriously but i don't make it serious right like, i'm gonna have a good time there are other people in the profession who who think that uh, well, i don't say they think i'm wrong they think fitness is a serious business and we should be more clinical in our approach and, and more standoffish and less fun neither yeah. one of those is correct mm-hmm. it's just strong or weak on on how you feel about that right i, I would be uh, some great coaches i know couldn't work in our environment and i know i couldn't go work in other environments so that, that culture and that environment is, if there's a secret sauce to my, to my Big Mac recipe, 
mm-hmm. it's probably developing that culture. Right. It's funny because when you when you said that, I thought about C. T. Fletcher. If, if you if yeah. you if you've seen his gym, there is nothing special about the equipment that he has. It's all big, oversized, clunky, nineteen seventies to nineteen yeah. early nineteen nineties, probably circa ninety one um, bodybuilding gym equipment. Um, and however, he has this culture in this cult of following because of who he is and that he's created this Mecca of strength lifting thing um, in his gym that people just want to be, they they buy tickets to just sit there and watch people lift. There's the most, it's almost like going to watch a strong man, but he brings people who have a passion for fitness and, and for strength themselves around. He has women involved. It's, it's a wild, have you ever seen one of these iron wars videos from his? like I, it's funny i was it was like 10 30 at night i'm watching one of his iron wars videos i'm like dude i want to go lift right now it's just <laughs> it's just that's it does something to you you know there is if you look at that idea right like west side barbell in ohio with their power lifters they've got a gym about the size of your your office there mm. right like it's um and there was a taekwondo team in, in scotland that in a 10-year period of time this team within scotland not not scotland outperformed the united states in terms of international medals wow. right and they're they're they don't have a secret training method they just yeah. have a culture of winning mm. right and it and it and it's it sort of success breeds success right that that continues to happen you see it with, with west side barbell and if you start looking at it can like, um, if you look at the companies that that are kind of crush their competition or the category number ones in in their field like nike it's starbucks things like that mm-hmm. they all have a system of core values an operating mm-hmm. system of, of their culture right and that's the only as much as they're all different again like virgin disney nordstrom's ritz carlton if you the one thing that they have in common is that not what the core values are that that's how they operate it right, right. and that's sort of the um the intangible of what we do, I think. Mm-hmm. That's great. And I believe in that firmly. And it's um, something that I think that people don't understand because they, you know, it takes a certain mind to understand culture in the business. And, you know, at first you, you start to think it's, it's the same thing that when people think about, for instance, why is it that this trainer who I know more about programming than is making more money than me? Yeah. And is it marketing? Does he look better? Maybe those things are true, but maybe it's also that he makes his clients feel like they're the only person in the world for 45 to minutes to 60 minutes. Yeah. It, it, that's it. I think it's the, the impact of, like if, if I give you a, na- a U.S. national team shirt, to join the U.S. national team at whatever the thing is, now it's bigger than yourself, mm. right? Now you're yep. like, like, and and the young guy comes on the team, and the young guys kind of messing things up, or young girl, the, the teammates will take him and say, "Hey, that's not how we do things here. Mm. Here's how we do things. Here's what we stand for." And it, you you get that at a at a national level, but it starts mm. at a local level, like how do we support it here and it. It, like I said, as the young coaches and gym owners listen to this right now, who are like, yeah, 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 tell me about contract agreements and marketing plans and, and things like that. But it, it does it does start with uh, your things that are important to you. Yeah, it's 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 very true. I was in one of your your uh, presentations. One of the things that you had presented was a book by Simon Sinek, Start With Why. Um, <clears throat> and I had never considered um, that question at the time that I listened to it. I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was not within the last 10 years, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, um, I think. Simon's book was before that. Yeah. And uh, and I had, it, it made me kind of contemplate um, what why actually means, right? I think that it's a multi-layered thing. I don't think it's one thing. Um, yeah. But I think it was a, it's a really good question. Um, why do you want to go in business why is business the right choice versus be staying an employee, making a lot of money as an employee and, and investing in the stock market, seeing mm-hmm. good results from your investments um, without the headache of always being um, 
just above break even, you know, yeah. and, um, and, 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 and doing that. What, what do you think makes people want to push past to, to why do trainers give up um, the being a great employee for being on their own? And I, you know, I, I have this thing also to add to that, which is be, because you hate your boss is a terrible reason to go work for yourself. It's just stupid. Yeah, agree a hundred percent, right? Like, and well, I think why did why did he leave? I like I don't I don't know. I I um I think it's that internal question, right? I I just had had frustrations. Like I I always thought I worked for myself when you're mm-hmm. a trainer. Like even though I mean I did some at the gyms I worked at, you would you would get your own clients and then give the the gym a percent of that, which as a young coach, you think is extremely unfair. Mm-hmm. And then when you open your own business, you're like, wow, what an amazing deal I had. <laughs> yeah. right? Like that was tremendous. <laughs> Ac- access to all these prospects right. for zero marketing dollars. And then all you know, I have to do is if I get the job, I give a I, I just say what to charge and I give a piece to the to the company. The funny like, thing you say this now, I thought about this and I say to myself now, I'm like, dude. I would get rid of all these liabilities in a second to do that because I'd make a half a million dollars a year flat out, you yeah. know, with no expenses. So I, I think it's, it's something internal that, that, that felt stifling to people or that they, they, they didn't like it. And this just, my mindset was always that I, I worked for myself mm. and I, I paid a piece of uh, the income to the gym And as a young trainer, I thought it was some of my money went to the gym. Now I give some of that same money to the landlord, Mm -hmm. to the marketing company, right? It's the same Mm -hmm. thing. There's a, there's a cut goes to someone to allow me to run my business. So I think it was perhaps this, um, I I can only speak personally. I just had frustrations at my environment and I wanted to control my own environment. I wanted Mm -hmm. to be, I wanted to own everything. I don't want to make excuses for a piece of equipment um, being being out of order or, or something else. So um, why did good trainers move to, to go on their own? I, I'll add, there's some amazing trainers who never did. They're just crushing it within great organizations and they're either they're at Exos or you know, Mike Boyle or within companies like Equinox and things like that. They're, they're just, they don't have that entrepreneurial drive. Mm-hmm. Like they don't have that. And I can tell you, I've got coaches working for me who are better trainers and coaches than I am because it's their singular focus, right? Mm-hmm. They're only concerned about rocking the mic and delivering an amazing training session or, or mm-hmm. getting that next program where I'm like, I don't want to say distracted. I just have other, I have a lot of things to do, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I have like a lot of other um, competing uh, tasks and ideas for my attention. So they, they can be better than me. And I, uh, I think you're, you're, to your point, just if if the odds of success leaving my facility to go on your own just because you didn't like me probably not high but if you have a concept or something to go to go further and then i'll 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 help you and the platform that you can have with me and and i've fixed done a lot of the mistakes you're about to make uh, i can help you avoid them so i i I think that's a great phrase is like just because you hate your your boss doesn't doesn't mean that you're going to succeed. Uh, it, it's a horrible reason to, it's probably the worst reason, right? Because yes. you could get another boss easier yeah. than deciding to, like if, if that's your business plan, I hated that guy. <laughs> that's, I don't know <laughs> if that's going to work. Right? <laughs> it's it's the worst business plan I've ever heard of in my life. And even the ones where people were serious are pretty bad too. You know, they actually want to write the business plan. You're like, yeah. okay, this business I did plan. A, I wrote a joke once on, uh, we, we were at a Perform Better 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were we were in without making fun of him. It was Craig Rasmussen, who's my head coach. Mm-hmm. We were at uh, I think we were watching the UFC or boxing or something, and we were at a, 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 a Hooters. Uh, I think it was Hooters, one of the places, Buffalo Wings, right? Right. And then uh, he uh, ended up putting Buffalo Wing uh, sauce on my shirt sleeve, <laughs> and I put it on Facebook. Right, that's it. Fired. I goes new pro- program. I goes new program design uh, expert and head coach. What did results fitness? Last guy fired for putting buffalo wing sauce on my sleeve. Uh, picture of us both. <laughs> and then we got applications. 
Did you really? Yeah. And I'm like, where did you tell these people I was only joking? But like, who, like, who, read, who read that and said, I want to work for that guy? Right. <laughs> like, yes. Have some self-respect for crying oh out loud. God, I, yeah. I mean, that guy, if you spell buffalo wing sauce, you're going to lose your job. I, that would be a great place for me. Like, exactly. <laughs> And then you put By the way, Craig, Craig is still with me, so it's it? all, always forgiven. He's he's been with me 15, 16 years now. No, but it's hilarious. It's like, first of all, who the heck are you? Why would you want even to go? <laughs> you're right. It's like, why would you why would you even want to do that? That is actually pretty hysterical. Yeah. There, there is a you talk about like I you, thought, talk, you, you know, this is why you have to put smiley faces and emojis on text messages to communicate oh your real intent. Right. I mean, the I think you'll, you'll I think it's Tony Robbins first showed me this that c- communication is only a small percent of the words. Mm-hmm. Tone and body language are the 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 biggest part of it. Right. right? Like uh, like if I'm like you're a total jerk or <laughs> you're a total jerk, they mean completely different things, right? You laugh at the second one. Exactly. Right? But you can't. That's the the why editors get paid a lot of money for books because mm. they can they can get the tone across where. Right. I always feel like uh, I've said this before to people. You you read that email I sent in your mood, not right. how I sent it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, so I'm like somebody's like doesn't realize I'm joking <laughs> about firing a guy for spilling <laughs> hot sauce on my sleeve. <laughs> that is hysterical. You talked about epidemics. There is one in the fitness industry. Um, you know, it's funny because I feel like I owe the fitness industry because it's the only industry I've been in. I went to school for psych, but like this is it. Like, this was like, really, um, this is the thing that has fed my kids and about all this other stuff. Right. Um, which is an 81% turnover rate. That is more than insanely ins- an insane turnover rate in an industry is 20%. 80% is uh, it's, it's barely workable. Like what is contributing to this turnover rate? Amongst amongst professionals or amongst the, the end user, fitness the, the numbers are similar, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's we're first generation, right? And we're not. I can tell you with um, we're we're recording this because uh, in uh, late 2021, uh, after mm-hmm. lockdowns, I believe that gyms were locked down because we've been all about abs and arms and butts, not about what we really do, which is real fitness and mental health and things like that. It would really right. help people. So we're never taken seriously. And that filters right down to, like, like as you said, like somebody sees my gym and like, man, I'm bigger than that guy. Right. I'm leaner yeah. than him. Mm-hmm. He's, he's making mad money. I'll be a trainer. Right. Where it's, it, it, it's and I, I think it's because we're like, if you think, I think my, my hero is probably Mark Verstegen. Um, yeah. My boy, all like these guys are my heroes, but they're still in it now. Like yeah. the first kind of generation of of strength and conditioning coaches, you know, maybe Albert Meal, who's who's retired, mm-hmm. and uh, but but after that, like we're still all around. So right. it's still part of it's just a young feel that that some of these people give it a try, realize how hard it is, and get out, yeah. right? Because they don't have a, they don't come up under someone. Like if mm. you're teaching karate, you came up under someone. Yeah, teaching you karate. If you're a math teacher, you you had a math teacher, mm-hmm. right? You came up with this almost apprenticeship built into your education. People are coming in as, as trainers just because they like working out, mm-hmm. right? They like exer- I like exercise. That right. then I would be a good trainer. It's the, I don't even ask that at an interview, right? right? Yeah. Like, do you, do you like? like I had a, a guy. Uh, we were watching a soccer game about a month ago. And then there's a guy, he's a, a police officer. And I hate telling people what I do when I'm out socially. Like really? uh, my friends take great delight in telling people this, right? <laughs> that he he's like uh like what he kept asking me, find out I own a gym, and he kept asking me, like, what it, what is it? Like, what kind of gym is it? Like, I don't really know how to answer that. Right? Like, yeah, me neither. A good one? Like a yeah. good one. <laughs> that I literally am in the same boat. Not to cut off the story, but I'm just like little, I goes. But what are your goals? And he's like, yeah. just like he got trained hard, right? He's in he's in good shape, and it was just to maintain. And I'm like, oh, I can't help you because <laughs> that's not what I do, right? If you're looking to make zero change whatsoever and you don't have any problems, I can't help you, right? Right. Um, and what is that? And what does that? What exactly does that mean to maintain? Yeah, I don't know. To make to just 
make no progress whatsoever. Like, I don't, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but I'm just, I can't, like, I can't help you. So I think that the, the turnout rate is partly, it's harder than people think. It's not, not yeah. what you think. Like it's, mm -hmm. you, you're not, you're, you're most of the time you're not working out. Sometimes you're so busy that after a full day of training clients, the last thing you want to do is stay for another hour. Right. <laughs> right. And do right. your own circuit. Right. So I think it's just the, um, like the, the is it messaging? Uh, uh, yeah. I, and I, I think it's the, we, the, the glamorization of it. Like you see the USC middleweight champion get his hand raised. Like that's from me. Mm -hmm. You don't realize you get kneed in the face four times that day, a right. hundred times in training and was up at four in the morning and he right. wasn't going out with his friends and he didn't get to eat the fried chicken. He got right. the grilled chicken and he got mm -hmm. the vegetables and you don't see the behind the, the reality of it. You don't, you don't see the education that goes into it. So it, it's the, um, as, as a martial artist myself, I can tell you my, my process of watching these things. I remember watching the very first uh, UFC that I saw and I remember thinking, what a tremendous concept. Once you get too close to kick or punch, you can start kneeing people in the face, elbowing <laughs> them in the face. Then you can take them down, grapple, right. put them in an arm lock, choke them unconscious. This is, a, this is a full range of combat. What a fantastic thing. And it was about two years later, I was like, wait a minute. They could elbow and knee me in the face? I had, I had never saw myself losing. Right. <laughs> I had never, I, I, that had never crossed my mind. Yeah. There's the possibility of this guy doing it back to me. Right. That was the time I knew it was time to retire, that my mindset had changed. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. Like, like I couldn't comprehend the, the, the uh -huh. I had the winning mindset for sure, to the point where I couldn't comprehend the opposite. So I, I think that just not under, like I don't want to say this job is harder than people think, that clearly with a dropout rate like that, it's harder than people think. Yeah, right. right. The, the fact that um, I have a, a client who used to go to a local gym and there was a young coach who's in great shape whose theory was do my workout hard mm -hmm. and you're not as in good shape as me, so you should go harder than me. Mm -hmm. And he's like, like I'm, I'm, this my client's going, I'm nearly 50. I can't, right. You're going to have to superset this set of deadlifts with, you know, a, uh, uh, arterial fibrillation device, right? Because I'm about to go down. Right, <laughs> right exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. It's because it's like people, I don't know. I think you're right. Maybe people just distill down their own version of what they think a fitness professional is. It's just making people sweat. Imagine if it was just, I don't, you don't even have to be a trainer to make people sweat. You just have them hit stairs at, at the local yeah. stadium and they'll sweat. Yeah. It's, but it's more than that. It is, you're right. It's, it's being uh, someone for them to speak through their issues with. I remember I had a client I worked with. Um, uh, how many years ago was it now? Jeez. You know, when you're in an industry for a long time, um, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and you were like 11. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You know, black don't crack. That's what they say. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, you know, I was, we were talking about her lack of progress. And I said, all I said to her was, so we sat down to talk about it. I said, so you're having some issues. And I, and, and I said, uh, she said, yeah, my diet's been inconsistent and blah, blah, blah. I said, but is that really the issue? What else is going on in your life? Tell me about other parts of your life. And then she just broke down crying because it was pressure from her parents to have a baby. And yeah. it was, she's not married yet. You know, and it's, and, and these things change, these types of behaviors change your relationship with things like commitment that could make you better. And also your choice of nutrition. Um, and also how frequently you exercise, because if the more you get depressed, sometimes the harder it is to actually get up and go to the gym, um, and to actually engage in behaviors that actually make you better because are they making me better or are they futility because I'm doing them and they're not entirely working and I'm not pregnant yet, or, and I'm not married yet, you know, whatever the case is. Um, and, and that can be extraordinarily draining on a profession, on a fitness professional, you know, because like when someone un unloads on you, um, that weight has to go somewhere, right? It, uh, so, and, and it usually, it usually, um, comes on the, the, the shoulders of the fitness coach who's absorbing this information come in and, um, and, and you, and you're doing this on top of that at five 30 in the morning, yeah, right? Yeah. Six in the morning, six 30 in the morning. And, and it gets, it gets really, 
uh, really hard to do that. Right. And then the, and then the gym owner is trying to re- hasn't replaced a, a piece of equipment that he probably should have a month earlier. Um, and he's being a little slow and that's a little frustrating because that's part of, that's a major part of your program. I, I can kind of see, I can see how maybe some of these frustrations can build up to um, both mental and physical burnout, but um, you know, I'm not exactly sure how to fix this from an employer well, side. It's just that we've not been like the barrier to entry is so low that, yeah. I mean, the, the reality is you need to have a certification because someone one time said you needed to have one. There's mm-hmm. actually no legal requirement for that. Right. Right. You can get insurance without one. Mm-hmm. Right. You can, it doesn't mean you're a good coach, but it's just the, the barrier to entry is so low that I, I think the dropout rate, half of that dropout rate is this is just not what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. This is harder than I thought. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think you get that dropout rate in like surgical oncology, right? Or things that right. are of a super high standard because these guys are aware like how this job is going to be tough, but the rewards are great. Right. I, so my, my thoughts are just, and perhaps there's no real career path, mm. right? For, for a young coach. Cause we don't, we don't have other than like in, internships and mentorships that, that are kind of a new thing. We don't have like, I, I, a young a young coach who just got the certification should not be opening their own business mm-hmm. you should not you should be going in under a, a coach and i don't necessarily mean at a big box gym i mean under a coach where someone can guide you and help you you're not yeah. just brought in as staff so like, it, us as a profession have to do a better job not just saying how how hard it is and um, that, that just sounds like self-serving man this job is so tough right. but like, it's you're in you're in great shape you're 20 years old you've never been overweight and you you're just saying like this will be fun i'll do mm-hmm. this as a job right it's the, the maybe the barrier to entry needs to be slightly higher than than we said it right and just maybe some type of a career. as much as i i don't i don't want to restrict anybody i'm a believer in complete like, autonomy with to a degree i suppose with what you want to do mm-hmm. um I, I think that that just the the dropout rate like is a I think there's the, uh, looking at tying it back to martial arts. I, I don't believe there's. I think it's like something one in a thousand get the black belt who take their first class because it's hard. Wow, right? It's harder than people think, right? Mm-hmm. And the the dropout rate. It's just there's there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who drop out honestly. That will tell you just before they got their black belt. Like is it interesting? It, it works. It works hard. Like they, they right. jump in a little bit. So I think perhaps it's, I don't want to say it's a badge of honor for those of us that, that have um, made it through, but it mm-hmm. just, it's, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, it's much harder than people think. And a lot of people, I think there's also this like a ego thing for no one asks for help. Yeah. Like, like you don't have to do this alone. There's people who, coaches and you know mentors and, and consultants that can help you there are these people who are just determined to never ask for help and do it on their own and they, it it's there's a few stories of people who've done that and succeeded that's why we know those stories because right. they are the absolute exception most people had someone help them on their journey you know it's funny that you, you mentioned the thing about standards and it's what else is funny is is so in the fitness, if you're listening to this podcast or watching, um, there, there's a, there's in some facilities and some companies, there's a designation called the master trainer. So I have a lot of issues with that designation um, because oftentimes that designation is exactly tied to how much revenue is generated um, and client load. And, and not yeah, yeah, not experience at all. And so you could have someone who come in for five years, doesn't even have close to 10,000 hours. Um, the, the, you know, you know, that, um, that I don't know if it's standard rule, but you know, it's 10,000 hours to master anything. Right. And, and then I think then, the only people like, uh, anybody who's done 10,000 hours tends not to dispute that it's from Malcolm Gladwell and outliers. The only people who seem to argue it haven't that right that. there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, my bookshelf, right? <laughs> they, they haven't hit that number yet. When they yeah. like, I, I don't. I think it. it it's yeah. Uh, that's, actually, that's a good point. That the people who have actually done the ten thousand hours are like, 
Yeah, that's about right. And maybe it's 15 and not 10. I can tell you, competing in Taekwondo and, and compared to martial arts, my success started to happen right about then. Mm. Like, if I look back from beginner to then with dedicated right. practice, and I think that's the other part. It's not 10,000 hours of the same hour 10,000 times. Right. It's developmental and dedicated practice. My, my international success started to happen around about, about that time. Uh, Interesting. I think that I'm sure there's a phenom who's done it faster. Mm-hmm. Not too many. The, the term master trainer, um, again, in martial arts, it's, and I understand the need for it from, from marketing or for understanding things. But originally, that was a designation um, awarded posthumously. Like when, when someone mm-hmm. passed away, like when that guy was a true master of karate. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't a, 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 it wasn't originally something that they gave to people as a, as a designation for reaching a certain level. It was, it was even beyond skill set. It right. was about like a recognition of their entire career. Like, right. like, a, like, like a lifetime being achievement. In, being in the hall of fame. Yeah. Like right. uh, generally requires you to be retired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. No, it's, it's true. Um, it's, it's become more apparent now um, to me that this is the case. And you're right. I, so when I first started in the industry, before I owned anything, I was working, I was cleaning treadmill caps over the motor. I had to bring an extra uniform on my hands and my knees, cleaning, cleaning machines, uniform would get all dusty, dirty. I never complained about doing it because not because it was so awesome to just roll around in dirt and sweat, but um, number one, it was, I work here, so I should do it. Um, yeah. And people are going to look at it. Um, the other thing was there was, for me, there was pride in, doing the little things right right kind of like the make your bed or clean your room if yeah, you're jordan yeah, peterson yeah. um or 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 uh, uh make your bed if you're uh what's the admiral's name from the army yeah, the Navy that gets- i'm blanking on it but that that's exactly who i was thinking yeah it was like to me that was the make your bed moment it was clean this treadmill make it look shiny um and then i had no clients when i first started and then i clean i get clients and it's like eventually you have then, then your role changes and you switch. Ask a, ask a new coach today to clean a treadmill on their hands and knees. They would uh, quit. It, they would- it's an interesting. I just got back from New York City uh, last night and mm-hmm. I went and visited one of my first bosses in the, in the field, Gary Guerrero, who's a U.S. athletic training center in Midtown. Mm-hmm. And the ships then were, I worked from 5 a.m. till 7.30 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I took clients Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Now, I the laws have changed. I'm not suggesting right. anything. Um, I just saw that as what an amazing opportunity mm-hmm. for me. Um, and my, my career moved and, and evolved. Uh, and I joked with him, if, if I offered that opportunity to some mm-hmm. of my staff, who, who are very good, uh, they'd call the police. <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> I'm only partially joking, right? That it's that right. especially well, especially in California. Oh um, yeah. Well, oh, I, my. Honestly, I could I, I can go on a um I'm just gonna go on a rant right now. I believe opportunity looks a lot like work, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes recognition looks a lot like more work mm-hmm. in the form of opportunity, which is work. Yeah. Uh, in in California, if I I have a full-time employee who needs to make extra money and wants to work an extra shift, then the, the gym would have to pay them one, one and a half times their rate or, or double, right? Which is completely, mm-hmm. it's California law, it's completely fine. We have to have breaks at certain times, but some of my staff wouldn't want, they'd rather finish early and go home. The law requires we, we, we do it this way and I'm fine with that. But if my staff member wants extra work, it doesn't make sense for most gyms to give it to them. It makes mm-hmm. sense for them to hire someone else to right. do it. So that employee could go somewhere else and start working a second job who doesn't have to pay them a higher rate. Right. So, I mean, the system isn't set up to protect the employee. It's mm-hmm. set up to punish the business. Mm-hmm. Right? That's right. There's one I'm like, like, I cannot give my staff extra shifts. As, as much as I talk about like that, they'd call the police if I offered them that. Right. It would be illegal for me to do that. Or... Right. or I couldn't do it. It would make no financial sense mm-hmm. to have someone work a double shift yeah. and pay them 50% more for the second shift. 
as a business owner that you can't do that. You would have to get another coach. So some of these opportunities that I had are no longer there for young coaches, mm-hmm. right? Because of, of, of things that, that are set up like that. So, but it's, it's definitely like, it, yeah, young coach, could you clean the treadmill? Like, that's not my job. It's like, I mean, dude, it's below no. me. I didn't come here to uh, clean the treadmills. It's like, okay. Yeah. Um, I clean the treadmills. Uh, you better than me. Like, and I'm writing your check, <laughs> you know, yeah, there's a joke that, uh, the, that, like, I think it was a guy walking in with his daughter and she didn't know what an owner was because what's an owner dad and she tried to explain it. And then he walked in with her and picks up some trash at the front and puts it away as he's walking to his office. And she goes, I know what an owner is. He's the guy that picks up the trash. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. Well, Bedros Koulian would say that it's the guy that signs the front of the check, not the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, you know, it's funny that you that you say that. I it, there is an amazing gap between what people think they know about running small business or business in general, and what actually happens on the ground. Like there is no law that like it's like I mean I think you made a really compelling point, and and which is that you you you're just not going to give them you're not going to put your your business in financial jeopardy to give a person to satisfy some ridiculous, um, some ridiculous, you know, um, jurisdictional law that requires you to pay them in exorbitantly more than, than what you value there, that jobs, not them as a person, but that job in particular at, it doesn't make any sense. Role, not the person. I think if you think about the the reason for overtime rules and how it started is because this, uh, this, this employee is is tired right this is where it started mm-hmm. from it so they they because they're working late and they you have to pay them a, a little more and and i'm all about that but then if they're tired they're not as good right all right it cost me more money for a guy not as good none of this makes yeah. sense when you start being you know running running a business but it's uh it, it's it's the um opportunity looks a lot like work <laughs> right? <laughs> and a, a, another quote i have is it you know it's at some point mm-hmm. hard work looks a lot like talent yeah, yeah. you put in enough work right That's you right. put enough hours in reading the books and doing the courses and training the clients and taking the notes developing mm-hmm. yourself people will compliment you on how gifted you are that's right it's it's so true <laughs> It's so true. You know, the funny thing is the personification of that is probably Tom Brady. I'm a, obviously I'm in Boston, so uh, I'm a New England Patriots fan. Um, but irrespective of my what some would call um, hometown bias is there is a real actual lesson behind his story, um, which is that he is he was actually probably the least athletically gifted individual in that entire combine. Yeah. Sands the guy that's holding the clock to time is 40. Right. Like. <laughs> like yeah. he, he literally and maybe that guy is probably more jacked than he was but like you know he had to put in enough work to get to a position to be a fourth round of uh, the fourth quarterback on the depth chart yeah. and then he and then he worked just more more frequently more accurately more specifically at at specific things to get better and then he got a, he got good enough to become a backup and then maybe there was a time when the person in front of him would retire um, or get knocked out of a Jets game, Drew Bledsoe. Um, <laughs> and maybe it wouldn't happen, but it happened. And, but he was prepared for the opportunity. But it was because of all the extra work that he had put in prior to that. His salary was his salary. Yeah, He, was, he wasn't getting paid more for the, – the, the stories are that um, people would be leaving um, Fox World Stadium at the time, um, or maybe it was Gillette Stadium. And his car would be the only one in the parking lot and the lights would still be on in the field house and he'd still be in there working. Yeah. It, even after the coaches left. And, but his salary was still the same. Yeah. So, so how do you quantify mastery? How do you quantify w- willingness and desire? I think you're, I think you're on to something. Opportunity looks a lot like work. Opportunity is just time and space. That's all it is. Yeah, you, you think that, uh, I mean, there's similar stories about Cristiano Ronaldo, the soccer player, and mm-hmm. staying, you know, grabbing a young guy. Can I can I have him and, and the, uh, the ball to I want to work on something? And he's still at the top of his game. He's still playing at Premiership. 
Brady in particular, is we have documented evidence that he wasn't great. Mm-hmm. Right? right. And now, now like our people will talk about how talented he is. Mm-hmm. Right. Like we talk about how talented. Imagine how hard you have to work to make it to the NFL. Yeah. Then to make it to starting when you mm-hmm. win it. You, you, you didn't get drafted to be the guy. Right. Like you, you turned yourself into, and, and uh, there's a, a martial arts thing. There's a phrase in End of the Dragon, the Bruce Lee movie. Uh, we are unique gentlemen and that we forge our we forge our bodies in the fire of our will mm. right and that's I like exactly, that. exactly what tv has done is that you you the, there's no conversation about the greatest of all time regardless of your thoughts or your hometown bias there's no conversation about the greatest of all time it doesn't have him in the mix that's right uh, and potentially the conversation for greatest athlete of all time yeah right? which is ironic and we have the numbers, we have the data. NFL right. shows you the data, and mm-hmm. it's it's uh, it's quite. But it's it's um, like, what did you do today to get better? Mm-hmm. Right? There's he he'll answer. He has an answer today of what he did. Right? Like so, it's I, I, I like I said, it keeps coming around to, to opportunity. Looks a lot like work. And do you do you feel like this that um, let's just call it philosophy, um, tracks with your own career and, and, and what you built professionally. And now you may maybe hand wave um, my comment, what you did, what you built professionally, but there is obviously yield from the work you've put in over the years and fitness pros that would love to be in your position. Um, do you feel like that philosophy tracks with where you are now? I, I agree. I I'm currently reading Will, Will Smith's biography, which is co-authored by Mark Manson, which is a co-author. Mark Manson, I believe, is a co-writer slash editor. Um, and there's a video of uh, Will Smith on a, a Travis Miley show uh, many years ago. Mm-hmm. He goes, the only thing unique about me is I'm not, I'm prepared to die on a treadmill. Yes. We both mm-hmm. got on the treadmill. Two things are going to happen. You're mm-hmm. going to get off first or mm-hmm. I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. I will not be outworked. And I, I don't know if I had that to that level of, you know, eloquence, how he said it. I, I just had this, this idea, and I, I got it from my Taekwondo instructor. He was, um, if you can read, you can read, you can learn anything that anyone's ever learned mm-hmm. because it's written down in books. Right. It's like even easier now because it's on podcasts and videos, right? Yep. If you can consume the information, you can learn anything that anyone ever learned. Mm-hmm. You just got to want it because it, it's easy to come home and not go to the gym. Right. That's easy. It's like, I think there's a phrase from Brian Tracy that a, an hour a day of reading, you'll know more than anyone on this topic within a year, mm. a year, mm-hmm. right? You'll be one of the best in the country within three years. And by five years, you'll be a world authority. It's an hour a day. It's easy to do. It's unbelievable. It's really easy, easy not to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it can, you heard that. I, I think I got this from Jim Rohn, um, who's a, a business philosopher. Uh, if, if an apple a day keeps the doctor away, it, it, it's pretty simple. You would yeah. do that. But it's also simple to skip the apple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like day <laughs> right. one, you got to buy seven apples to last a week. Did you right. do that? And you're already planning. You've got two. You're already planning to stop day three. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it, some things that it's, it's easy to not read the book is, and I, I, I tell at seminars, you spent an hour a day doing something. Mm-hmm. Was it watching a Netflix show? Mm-hmm. Was it watching the game? Was it yeah. something like, like, I'm not judging what anybody does, but there, I had the philosophy that I, I this, this, all I have to do to is what am I, I need to learn assessments to work with my clients. Who's the best in the world at this stuff? All right, like I, I think it was Gray Cook and Lee Barton with the functional movement screen. Um, right. uh, Paul Check, perhaps. I was like, all right, they have stuff published. I will just get that. I'll just invest in me and get their material and mm-hmm. download the software. Mm-hmm. Right? And, right. And that, I, if there was any, again, other than the culture thing, uh, I, they, there's Ari, Ari de, de, de Juche is a, a phrase. He was the, head of shell oil for a while mm-hmm. was the only sustainable competitive advantage you have is to learn faster than your competition yeah yeah so i always had that in, in my in my head is that i if 
like they, we're talking about information as currency, right? If you're not making enough money, I, ideas are money. Information is currency. You just need to get the information. Mm-hmm. And that's how I thought is that there's a, from, a, from being a young coach, I, I said my income at one o'clock on Friday, regardless of my situation, that mm-hmm. money went to professional development every single week. Like right. if I made twenty dollars, I bought a twenty dollar book. I mm-hmm. saved it up to put it to a course, but it 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 was off the top. Professional development was an important part of my my investments. So, I guess that professional success, to to use your term, is it, it starts with with that drive and that question. There's got to be a better way to do this. Mm-hmm. We got to be able to do this better than we're doing. Mm-hmm. Right? How how can we enhance this? How can we accelerate this? So. Uh, I think you've got to be a little bit of an education junkie right, to, to right. succeed at some level. You know, one of the interview questions I ask if we're hiring someone is how many, what's the last book they read or how yeah. long has it been since they read something? Yeah. Because I, I want to know um, how attached they are to their own ideas of what they think is right or how willing they are to challenge their beliefs um, and to grow beyond that. And it's funny because uh, I had a friend say to me, he goes, uh, you know, I see you all the time. You just seem so motivated. I'm like, if you wake up the next day in life and you have a whole nother opportunity in another day to kind of crush it, like why wouldn't you take every advantage in the world to do that and, 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 and be better in every category that you can, you know, the difference between, you know, I, I, there was a Mark Cuban that said, like, you have to work like someone is working to take it away from you 24 hours a day. Yeah. I mean, that, that may be a little glib, but like, it's still, there's a really there, profound a, point there. A champion boxer has a number one contender coming up. Yeah. You, you got to, if there's somebody coming, like, like not, not to have a, a mentality of scarcity, but you like mm-hmm. keep the game sharp, right? Like you gotta, you gotta keep the game sharp, right? And it's, um, you know, some people are, I watched, we went to a comedy show in New York City and you're watching these like young comics just work, work on their material and, and uh, like just little bits and they're, they're trying to get this, uh, this work, this bomb, like, and they're, mm. they're just working on it. And like, that's all behind the scenes. They're recording it on their phone or they're, they're videoing it and they're going to review it themselves and they're going to work on their, 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 their craft. But right. by the time you get to be like a Chris Rock selling out the garden, like you didn't see the reps. Mm-hmm. you're like i'm funnier than my friends tell me i'm funny mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, i should right. i should have a sold out garden show on you like right you're, like you're just chris rock was in these underground little clubs just working on his stuff mm-hmm. like working on his game right and it's mm-hmm. the same the same thing is that that uh like burning desire to be better at his thing is just this desire to be better you change the thing he'd have still been great i was watching um <laughs> comedians and cars getting coffee there was an episode with eddie murphy and, and uh he was talking about his first experience with comedy when he was 17 and he he went out like i don't know it was something like two hours away from his house and his uh he was going on and he was supposed to get paid uh, that night so that he could take the like a a cab or something back to um you know back to yeah. back back home so he goes out there, he bombs, <laughs> and then he says, he said, I go up to the club owner, and he goes, um, excuse me, sir, um, I heard that it's you I'm supposed to get the money from, and the, <laughs> the guy said, he said, the guy says, you better get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> so he ended up having to call his dad to come, <laughs> and pick, and come and pick him up. So him and his dad are driving back home in the car, and he said, his dad said to him, listen, he's like, you think you're funny? He goes, no. He goes, you're going to go home. You're going to work nine. He said, you're going to go to work at nine. You're going to get off at five. He said, and I don't want to hear anything else about this comedy thing. <laughs> uh, it was so, it was so funny, but like the, he didn't let that deter him. He just kept working and working, of course. And he's one of the greatest ever, but, um, but it's true. It's true. I mean, um, so what, what is your, um, your latest pride and joy book that you've produced and what are you reading right now? Um, well, I'm reading Will Smith's uh, uh, autobiography. Oh, you're still taking that. Okay. He wrote it. Yep. He, he, it's been a, a real enjoyable. Um, that uh, I, I, I also got a book by 
it's called um, a guy whose name is Stephen Bartlett. He's kind of mm-hmm. famous in the UK. Um, he has a podcast called Diary of the CEO. Mm-hmm. And I picked up, I was in the UK and they have this, uh, uh, at, at the stores at the airport, they have a, the bookstore has a buy one, get one 50% off. So I, uh, I got a book as a Scottish comedian just published his autobiography, a guy called Billy Conley, who's drawn about comedy. Very, mm. very funny guy. He's, he's, you know, in his mid to late seventies now, I believe. And uh, his his story. So I picked that up, and then used to, as a guy. I don't want to take not take advantage of the fifty percent off. So <laughs> yeah, this of course. Book from Stephen Bartlett was called Happy Sexy Millionaire, mm-hmm. and uh, so I picked that up. And uh, but his uh, his podcast was I was listening to one. Yeah, this is funny as we're going into this now. His latest one I listened to was when he, uh, he actually interviewed a friend of mine, Jimmy Carr, who's a professional comedian in the UK. Mm-hmm. He interviewed him about not about comedy, about business and life skills. So that was what I'm listening to. And I'm, I'm reading the, the, the Will Smith book. Um, but that book, by uh, it's interesting when you travel internationally, there's a whole world of business books where we, like, we couldn't name a famous cricketer over here. Right. Over there, I mean, NFL is, is bigger, but um, they're, they're, they they know Brady. They, they, they know people like that. But uh, a biography of an NFL guy or an NBA guy is, is lesser known in Scotland and England than they would be over here. Mm-hmm. Similarly, there's books from sporting athletes over there. The same. There's also this world of business books. I feel like it's this cheat code of amazing business books that no one over here knows. Interesting. This guy, he's actually, we have Shark Tank over here. Mm-hmm. and they they have dragons there it's the same concept yes. exact yep. same show. i've seen it but he's he's going to be one of the dragons this guy stephen bartlett that i'd never heard of before mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. that book was good so there's there's a book a podcast a podcast episode and another book that's what I, what i'm consuming <laughs> right now and uh, my um i mean in terms of stuff i've published the the book behind me um that says i'm right i'm still looking at the thing the secrets of successful program design is um my first book uh, by a mainstream publisher for the fitness professional. I published stuff myself and we have our website, result, resultsfitnessinnercircle.com, which is our continuing education. Um, all the DVDs and videos and seminars I've ever given are all in there, mm-hmm. uh, like, a, like a little Netflix. But this is the first um, mainstream published book for, for our industry yeah. that I, I'd ever done. So that's my, um, uh, th- that's my, most proud of thing um uh, in terms of publications right now right that that's the like i said you could get ideas you could reverse engineer you could get new rules of lifting or strong and you could reverse engineer the programs and use them for your clients this is the first time when i showed you the recipe yeah right, in, in that book yeah that's awesome you know because i do i get these <laughs> these google scholar alerts from all these like white papers on like lifting and stuff like that. And, you know, even though like I'm not training every day myself, like I do. So I still have like professional client athletes that I train, like I'll I'll travel to and train them and stuff like that. But like in terms of like in the gym, everyday training, you know, much like yourself, I'm kind of focused on running the business, but like, I love reading these white papers all the time that get published because there's so much information, you know, I'm, I'm almost jealous of this generation because if like we had our work ethic combined, you know, back in the day, combined with the internet or YouTube and podcast, like when I started in the fitness industry or just in general, like working, like it, I can't even imagine how well but, so but many you, people in this generation would But be don't you think that, that that is a challenge in and of itself is that I, I had to edit my uh, undergrad thesis on creatine monohydrate. I mm-hmm. had to take the train from college in Chester to the University of Liverpool public library I had to go to the actual physically published journal, find if there was anything on creatine, read mm-hmm. it. If it was good, I had a photocopy the physical article to have right. my own copy. Now, mm-hmm. if you type creatine monohydrate into Google, there's more material than you could read in your lifetime. Yeah. Like I think the challenge now for a young coach might, might be well, you, you and I had to find information. Right. They have to filter it. Yeah, they have to develop a skill as to what do I ignore. Yeah, right. Like the like. <clears throat> so with, with the white paper stuff, what's is there anything you've changed your mind on in the last, you know, a little while? That's a great question. Um, 
so fasting is one I've read. I, I I'm a big fan of fasting, but fasting is one major one fat and fasting and athletic performance as well. Um, yeah. what I think that you, um, you used to, you used to feel that that was a bad idea and you change your mind. Not necessarily bad, but I, I felt like it was not the most appropriate use of energy. And I thought that it was hard because I think that athletes need more timing of macronutrients than gen, huh. general, the general population. I, I mean, I, I think I'd probably still like the, the debate on nutrient timing. I always thought was strange is that the water counts. Should you try a race dehydrated? No, you're, you're not going to save it and drink your water at the end. You're going to try to, <laughs> so like there is, that, that's a good one. I like asking people that question. Like, what have you changed your mind on? Yeah. Well, then, then I really boil that every day, by the way. I could have something. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's true. I listen to his rants. All, he's always ranting on someone. Um, and then, um, well, then I looked at like, well, I was looking at like some case studies to kind of not to prove the point, but to think about it. And I, and I, re- and I found out that um, I think that Herschel Walker was on an OMAD diet when he played for, you know, played in the NFL. He, he ate yeah. one meal a day. Yeah. And he, he, he was I mean, awesome. There's a, there's a, not, not to, you know, minimize your point. There's a genetic anomaly, right? Like a guy. Well, yeah, with, of course. Race, right. right? Just, yeah. Just, did sets of 500 push-ups. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I know. Amazing. yeah, no, he's, a, he was amazing. And um, so, you know, and, and I, and obviously I still think there's a component to timing and how you do it. And, um, but I don't think that you can necessarily eliminate, for instance, things like fasting completely out of someone's, someone's deal. I, I like Boyle's rants on, um, student athletes playing multiple sports. That is a massive gap. And with mm-hmm. the, with the proliferation of specialty sporting clinics across the country. Yeah. For nine-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. And I say that as someone whose son goes to a basketball camp on a yeah. weekly basis, but like, I don't think that we're doing them any, a, a decent service. I mean, look, specializing is fine. I think that are we becoming more of a too overly specialized um, society and it, aren't there more benefits neurologically and physically to, to randomize play and, you know, for a kid growing up. Um, and, 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 and beyond that, there is, I think there's mental and emotional benefits to, um, randomize different activities that children go through because, um, of also the proliferation of depression and anxiety in this generation of children. And Jonathan Haidt did an excellent book. Oh, and he does a, a, a workshop on the coddling of the American mind. And one of the things he talks about is, that he contributes to the rise in depression and anxiety in young kids to the fact that they're not being put in, that their playtime has been reduced by like 50% or more, depending on where they live. And also due to the proliferation of lawsuits across the country um, because of playgrounds and how how they're constructed. Um, And now they're plastic and rounded, the ground is soft. Like you can't accidentally cut yourself on a playground like you could before um, that taught you how not to re-engage with something that was sharp and metallic. Um, And you kind of going through that small trauma, but trauma nonetheless, that gave you, that gave you these life skills. So like his take on randomized play and athlete burnout, I see this all the time. So I'm in the squash world in the sense of, I I trained um, the U S best squash player, Mm -hmm. um, Amanda Sobey. Um, and there, they have a lot of juniors who play squash. Um, and so I, 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 I'm more of a movement guy in squash and I focus on that, but these, but a lot of parents, they beat their kids into the ground with, um, how much they practice, how much they, uh, how much they practice the skill, even if their kid is nowhere near going to be good enough to either become a pro or even get a college scholarship. Um, and then how much they train. And then you ask them to do like two days of strength training for God. I mean, it's like, yeah. why don't you do a couple of days of strength training? And then the parents are like, strength, they're going to lose their flexibility. They're going to get too bulky for squash. It's like, how is that yeah. still a thing? Right? Like, like how are we still there that this will make you worse? <laughs> like, I don't know. 
<laughs> Who would win? The top male or the top female? The male. Why? Stronger. Oh, so strength is important? Okay. <laughs> it's like what gives. I, dude, I have seen, I've worked with 14-year-old squash players um, whose parents think they're going to be phenoms with back issues at 14. Hmm. You couldn't, unless I got hit by a truck or fell out of a tree when I was 14, yeah. I didn't have a back issue. But I was also jumping, squatting, running around, yeah. doing things outside. And, you know, you know, squash is like a very lunging sport. But with underdeveloped glutes, your back, forget it. You know, you yeah. just, you know, forget doing glute exercises. And so I always ask them, well, what, well, what is your kid doing? Um, like for, like, do they work out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they just do bands and uh, they just do bands and things to like lengthen. There's this whole lengthening the muscle thing. Well, I don't know where this came from. Dancing, right? Is like it that, that, like, like the long lean muscles of Pilates? Yeah, I think it came came from that. Like a, your, I mean your, the attachments of your joints are pretty much established <laughs> as to how long that muscle is going to be. Right, but it's I mean from a marketing point of view for young coaches listening, just agree and go. That's exactly what we work on. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of the things we work on with our, our youth athletes is developing that that length in the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, it's funny because that's pretty much the conversation. It's like, yeah, yeah. So we'll do some of that. I get yeah. them alone. We do none of it. And it's yeah. like, what, what are we doing today? We're just hitting your glutes, buddy. That's it, literally all a, we're doing. Part of, um, I, I think I got this from Jim Liston, who was the strength coach for the Los Angeles Galaxy soccer team. And he said it, he um, to get buy-in, he starts them on the soccer field with a couple of drills between practice things or a mm. little extended warm up with a couple of things. And then as the guys get stronger and they can lunge, you'll increase the reps or holds or explosion. And then they'll say, uh, you're kind of graduating out of this. We're probably going to have to and take you to the next level. We're going to move you into the weight room and take this to the next level. Mm. So now they're like, wow, this is, this is what I do for the next level. Like he starts <laughs> them on the field. I like right? that. So it looks yeah. like soccer. Right, it feels like soccer, right? Mm -hmm. and I think one of the challenges for any um, sport-specific training is like golf or anything that you want to do. One of my my coaching members, there's a he, he trains a lot of jujitsu athletes. Someone has only enough time to spend on the thing they want to do. Right, you've got to be so valuable that that they'll spend time with you. They don't have extra time. They have to take away time from the thing. They have to play less golf to work mm -hmm. with you to get better at golf. And some people are just, maybe they don't buy it. They mm -hmm. don't want it. Right. Like I'd, I'd rather have eight hours of golf a week than six and two hours in the weight room. Right. Yeah. Two hours with the strength coach. So there, there is some, um, there's the people who are prepared to not do the thing to get better at the thing, small mm -hmm. percentage of people. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. I think that's, that's pretty much, I think what it boils down to. Oh, you want to get better at squash? or whatever sport golf, just keep playing, just keep playing and, and your skills will enhance. However, um, this is like almost like the, you know, the talent, hard work argument. Okay. But, but you keep collapsing in various phases of this, trying to perform this skill. And so at what point will your body's inability structurally to put you in a better position to use your skills affect your game and and actually um, affect your ability to last and to actually perform over time. There, there's a thing just uh, to be, to be current is a, there's a transgender athlete just entered swimming mm -hmm. and just smashed the, the women's records. Is it man to uh, a woman or a woman to man? Uh, a man to woman and just okay. smashed the, the women's records. See, that's the thing is I don't see much going the other way and having great sporting success. Right. Uh, no, so, no. And, I can't, and I can't imagine it will. I, I'm not trying Transphobic is a strange word anyway, because I'm not afraid of them. Phobic is the wrong word. Um, mm. th this, uh, the, the biology is that strength training is an advantage. Strong is a massive advantage, mm -hmm. right? I, I use the phrase with our athletes, strength training is a cheat code. Right. If this was in pill form, it would be illegal, and we would test for it to make sure. The reason we don't allow males to compete against females, kids against adults, um, you weight classes in combat sports are because strength is a massive advantage that's so right we have to establish first of all strength training is a legal cheat code mm -hmm. secondly there are things that you need for high level success in the sport that cannot be developed by just more practice right, right. The, the, 
that you the figure skating is a uh, excellent example that you need a strong upper body and core in order to do some of the very basic jumps that these young girls do that will not be developed by trying it and falling on the ground right like it will not come we have to develop it out, outside of that and that's my i think in the past that the goal of the strength coach we, people seem to replicate what the sport already did mm -hmm. they would jump basketball players like they would practice jumping and right. you know like where we should be practicing what what we should be developing what the more more practice couldn't develop mm -hmm. uh, an nba player a basketball player doesn't really need more plyometrics that's just practice that's <laughs> right. right like, like did you our, see the last dance yeah yeah jordan didn't become jordan until he started strength training yeah yeah he literally said that in the uh tim grover and jordan both said that in the biography how did he get better at basketball he actually he literally hit the weight room is yeah. what he said yeah that, that's a fantastic documentary series by the way that's it was awesome outstanding right? and scotty pippen needs to stop whining and Owning right now, he's, he's he like, should do his own one, but I'm like, I, I'm I'm withholding judgment until I see the one that, that he produces. <laughs> I like, wasn't there, I wasn't there. I'm just gonna. This dude's been crying for like 30 years. It's like, okay, like, I can tell what side you're story. taking on this one <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Stop being jealous of Jordan. Like everyone, so everyone suspected that you were jealous. Now you're just confirming it. We're not. Then, we're not letting you on the jury to judge this trial. <laughs> you'd no, be disqualified. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Alan Cosgrove, you are. Look, we could probably do this for another two hours. I'm going to stop it here. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do it? Uh, you know, honestly, D I can give emails and stuff. DM me on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Slide into my DMs, as they say, <laughs> as the kids say, <laughs> and uh, that that's the the right now that that one doesn't get too overwhelmed. That's how we ended up booking the show, right? <laughs> so yeah, why not? Uh, that that's it, the one that doesn't get well, too. Well, let me say, I booked the show by DMing DM him on Instagram. However, I was right in front of his face because we were at a the at the a same event together. Yeah. But and I told you this was how to get the easiest way to get in touch with me too. Yeah. The same advice, right? So it, yeah, that's it, funny. I'm not just just saying that. So yeah, that's the the thing. But I always like a, a my little sort of check is make sure you're following me, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Exactly. I'm like, yeah, so no, that, for sure. But that that's the easiest way to to get more of uh, my my content. It's either Instagram mm -hmm. or our our membership website, resultsfitnessinnercircle.com. Awesome. That's great. So I want to have you back on um, again, I think, to talk about um, we didn't get into a lot. of We got into a lot of bit. Well, we got into a lot of stuff. Uh, this was truly a Rogan type pod, Rogan style podcast. Um, uh, I want to kind of dip into more business principles, I think, with you and um, talk about yeah. um, the future of fitness. Um, and I want to. Well, I've got some good things to say there. Get your take. About, and that, <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is called opening a loop. That means you'll be back for the next one. There you go. Is it is it a hologram? Is it a mirror? <laughs> you know, is it? Did you hear about the um, the new fitness concept over Seven Elevens in Asia? Like, it's a weird thing. Well, a little bit, but you have to explain it now for the listeners. <laughs> nope, I'm gonna leave that one open loop, ah, uh, open ended too nice until the next done. time. Nice <laughs> exactly. We'll Thank break you. that down. <laughs> yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. All right. Uh, thank you for coming today. And thank um, you for I'm having me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Looking forward to uh, having you back. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Common Sense Show, hosted by Michael Logan. The producer for The Common Sense Show is Paul Logan. To reach out to Micah and The Common Sense Show, talk to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search The Common Sense Show. And if you enjoy the show, Please don't forget to rate and or review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you for listening.